Good evening, everyone. Welcome. We are so excited to welcome you to Theater of Wars, the Frederick Douglass Project. My name is Sita Frederick, and I am the director at the Center for the Performing Arts at Penn State. And on behalf of the College of Arts and Architecture and all of our partners at Penn State, I am so happy to welcome you um, to the Frederick Douglass Project. Everyone um, that is showing up and building community tonight, thank you for being here to honor Black History and Futures Month and to build community and connections through the arts. As a gesture of honoring our collective past, present, and future, I would like to start by offering an acknowledgement of the land. In collaboration with the Indigenous Peoples Student Association and the Indigenous Faculty and Staff Alliance, this acknowledgement um, was written and we offer it tonight for all of us on <laughs> the ground. The Pennsylvania State University campuses are located on the original homelands of the Erie, Haudenosaunee, Lenape, Managohila, Shawnee, Susquehannock, and Wazazi nations. As a land-grant institution, we acknowledge and honor the traditional caretakers of these lands and strive to understand and model their responsible stewardship. We also acknowledge the longer history of these lands and our place in that history. We are here tonight to celebrate the relevant vision and legacy of Frederick Douglass and recognize that he didn't do it alone. He used gatherings like this and well, maybe not quite like this <laughs> and collaborated with organizers, cultural workers and thinkers like participants in our Zoom tonight to mobilize thinking and action towards meaningful change. So I'm so pleased to welcome you. And I just wanna acknowledge um, both our partners and the folks that made it possible for this event to happen, this global event to happen tonight. Um, we have great participation from across the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Um, and we are so happy to know that it's being live streamed. There are classes participating. Um, so we're gonna shout out uh, Altoona, Abington, University Park, Wilkes-Barre and World Campus tonight, but I know there's a lot more of you out there. Um, and we're gonna ask that if you are connected to Penn State, um, if you could please take our short survey um, so we can continue to build events like this one and bring us all together um, to exchange meaningful dialogue through the arts. And then I'll also just um, say and give gratitude to the support that was provided by the Richard Robert Brown Program Endowment. Um, thank you so much for your support. And then also uh, to the College of Arts and Architecture, College of Health and Human Development, the College of Liberal Arts, the Office of the Vice Provost of Commonwealth Campuses, Smeal College of Business, Penn State Wilkes-Barre and University Libraries. Um, and then finally, we wanna acknowledge the Colored Conventions Project and Douglas Day at the Center for Black Digital Research at Penn State. Uh, and Douglas Day will celebrate the birthday of Frederick Douglass with a global Black history transcribathon on February 14th. So please um, join that. And without further ado, thank you so much for being here. I will turn it over to none other than Brian Dorries. <laughs> thank you so much, Sita. It's so good to be here with you. It's an honor to be partnering with you and your colleagues at Penn State. Thank you for the invitation uh, to come together in this way. And thanks for your opening remarks. Um, my name is Brian Dorries. I'm the Artistic Director of Theater of War Productions, a company that works with leading film, theater, and television actors to present readings of seminal texts from classical Greek tragedies to sermons, books, speeches, screenplays, and modern works of poetry to provide a framework for engaging communities in powerful discussions about pressing issues of public health and social justice. And we are thrilled that you could join us tonight for our presentation of the Frederick Douglass Project featuring Keith David and co-presented by the Penn State College of Arts and Architecture and the Center for Performing Arts at Penn State. The Frederick Douglass Project presents readings by acclaimed actors uh, of speeches by Frederick Douglass for diverse audiences on Zoom as a catalyst for powerful dialogue about the impact of discrimination, racialized violence, structural inequality, and deferred justice upon individuals, families, 
and professionals and communities. We're proud to present, present the Frederick Douglass Project tonight, featuring the award-winning actor Keith David in honor of Black History Month and the upcoming 205th anniversary of uh, Frederick Douglass's birth. Also, we are pleased to open the event up to the public to foster powerful and constructive healing dialogue at this critical juncture in our nation's history. Before getting started, I wanna highlight that tonight's event will feature closed captioning in English on Zoom and communication access real-time translation or CART in English in a separate browser window. To access the live captions, please either activate them now at the bottom of your screen where you can adjust the font size. To access CART in a separate window, please click on the link provided in the confirmation email for tonight's event. And for those of you who missed that link, here is the link now. I'd also like to take a, just a brief moment to again thank our partners at Penn State and the College of Arts and Architecture, the Center for Performing Arts, with special thanks to Sita Frederick, the center's director. I'd also like to thank our collaborators at the Colored Conventions Project, Douglas Day at the Center for Black and Digital Research at Penn State. Our thanks also go to the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for their support of our digital programming. And finally, I would like to thank Marjolaine Goldsmith, Theater of War Productions Company Manager, who's been the architect and designer of all the work we've been doing on Zoom over the past now almost three years who will be conducting tonight's event behind the scenes. And now it gives me immense pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Theater of War Productions Company Liaison, Dominic DuPont, who will be co-facilitating tonight's event with me. Great to see you tonight, Dominic, over to you. Thank you, Brian, great to see you. Great to see everyone who made it tonight. It's an honor and privilege to be here. Uh, my name is Dominic DuPont, and I'm the community liaison for Theatre of War Productions. I've been with Theatre of War Productions for five years now. And what brings me to this space is really my personal experiences with the criminal justice system. At the age of 19, I was sentenced to a minimum term of 25 years in prison and a maximum term of life. After serving 20 years, seven months, and 18 days in maximum security prisons all across New York State, I received a pardon from the governor on January 22nd, 2018 and was released from prison. And I am honored and humbled to be in this space. Social justice, criminal justice, institutions that are in place to help us overcome a lot of things in life. My experience has been they have done everything but that. And tonight we're gonna have an opportunity to hear about how long these systemic problems have been in existence. An example of that is many situations, um, young black males being murdered by police officers. Other examples of that is systems of oppression that we rely on to help us get through these different challenges are often the ones of systems that keep us oppressed and are complicit in a lot of the challenges that continue on today. So I wanna thank you for this opportunity. I'm excited to see what's next. And I'm gonna turn things back over to Brian so that we can get started for tonight. Thank you so much, Dominic. It's wonderful to have you with us. It's always an honor to be collaborating and working together. Um, since the first time we met on Rikers Island to now, it's been one long conversation uh, and uh, we wouldn't have done it any of it without you. I'm so, so glad you're with us. Thank you again. Tonight's event is gonna unfold in three parts. Um, first, the inimitable Keith David will perform selections from a speech that was delivered by Frederick Douglass when he was 65 years old at the National Convention of Colored Men in Louisville, Kentucky on September 24th, 1883, nearly 140 years ago. When the reading is over, about 50 minutes in, Keith will go sit in the audience, so to speak, and will bring seven panelists up from the larger Penn State community who will respond from their hearts and their guts to what they heard and saw in Douglas's speech that resonated with them or touched them today. Following the community panelists' brief opening remarks, Dominic and I are gonna open up the floor to what we hope will be a lively healing construction with you, our global audience with us tonight. And during a discussion, the two of us will ask questions about the speech and what it says to people today. And if you'd like to respond to one of our questions, we ask that you just use the raise your hand function on Zoom to indicate you have something to say. For each question, we'll call upon a number of people who raise their hands and promote them to the screen for at least the duration of their remarks. Now, this is still new territory for us, uh, a new way of performing, a new way of communicating uh, over 100 plus performances in since the beginning of the pandemic that we've been doing these digital and hybrid events on Zoom. 
Um, so we apologize in advance for the fact that we won't get to everyone who raises their hands. Uh, and there could be glitches or technical issues during the event, but from our perspective, that's not only okay, it's, it's great. Making mistakes and overcoming them is at the center of our model. And our hope is that by getting messy and making mistakes and then adapting and moving on from them, we're modeling for you as an audience what we hope you'll do during our larger discussion. We hope you'll take the risk of joining us and making mistakes and not sounding brilliant or polished in order to be present in the moment with each other uh, and with us without judgment and with shared vulnerability. This is what makes us human and it's the only way forward. And now it gives me great pleasure to turn things over to Keith David for his reading of Frederick Douglass's speech from the National Convention of Colored Men in Louisville, Kentucky on September 24, 1883. Fellow citizens, charged with the responsibility and duty of doing what we may to advance the interest and promote the general welfare of a people lately enslaved, and who, though now free, still suffer many of the disadvantages and evils derived from their former condition, not the least among which is the low and unjust estimate entertained of their abilities and possibilities as men, and their value as citizens of the Republic. Instructed by these people to make such instructed by these people to make such representations and adopt such measures as in our judgment may help to bring about a better understanding and a more friendly feeling between themselves and their white fellow citizens. Recognizing the great fact as we do that the relations of the American people and those of civilized nations generally depend more upon prevailing ideas, opinions and long established usages for their qualities of good and evil then upon courts of law or creeds of religion. Allowing the existence of a magnanimous disposition on your part to listen candidly to an honest appeal for fair play coming from any class of your fellow citizens, however humble, who may have or may think they have rights to assert or wrongs to redress the members of this national convention, chosen from all parts of the United States, representing the thoughts, feelings, and purposes of colored men generally, would, as one means of advancing the cause committed to them, most respectfully and earnestly ask your attention and favorable consideration to the matters contained in this present paper. At the outset, we very cordially congratulate you upon the altered condition both of ourselves and our common country. Especially do we congratulate you upon the fact that the great reproach for which two centuries rested on the good name of your country has been blotted out that chattel slavery is no longer the burden of the colored man's complaint, and that we now come to rattle no chains, to clank no fetters, to paint no horrors of the old plantation to shock your sensibilities, to humble your pride, to excite your pity, or to kindle your indignation. We rejoice also that one of the results of this stupendous revolution in our national history, the Republic, which was before divided and weakened between two hostile and irreconcilable interests, has become united and strong. That from a low plane of life, which bordered on barbarism, it has risen to the possibility of the highest civilization, that this change has started the American Republic on a new departure, full of promise, 
although it has also brought you and ourselves face to face with problems novel and difficult, destined to impose upon us responsibilities and duties which plainly enough will tax our highest mental and moral ability for their happy solution. Born on American soil in common with yourselves, deriving our bodies and our minds from its dust, centuries having passed away since our ancestors were torn from the shores of Africa, we like yourselves hold ourselves to be in every sense Americans and that we may therefore venture to speak to you in a tone not lower than that which becomes earnest men and American citizens. Having watered your soil with our tears, enriched it with our blood, performed its roughest labor in times of peace, defended it against enemies in time of war, and at all times been loyal and true to its best interests, we deem it no arrogance or presumption to manifest now a common concern with you for its welfare, prosperity, honor, and glory. Why are we here in this national convention? To this we answer first, because there is a power in numbers and in union, because the many are more than the few, because the voice of a whole people oppressed by a common injustice is far more likely to command attention and exert an influence on the public mind than the voice of single individuals and isolated organizations. Because coming together from all parts of the country, the members of a national convention have the means of a more comprehensive knowledge of the general situation and may therefore fairly be presumed to conceive more clearly and express more fully and wisely the policy it may be necessary for them to pursue in the premises. Because conventions of the people are in themselves harmless, and when made the means of setting forth grievances, whether real or fancied, they are the safety valves of the Republic, a wise and safe substitute for violence, dynamite, and all sorts of revolutionary action against the peace and good order of society. If they are held without sufficient reason, that fact will be made manifest in their proceedings and people will only smile at their weakness and pass on to their usual business without troubling themselves about the empty noise they were able to make. But if held with good cause and by wise, sober and earnest men, that fact will be made apparent and the result will be salutary. That good old maxim which comes down to us from revolutionary times, that error may be safely tolerated while truth is left free to combat it, applies here. A bad law is all the sooner repealed by being executed, and error is sooner dispelled by exposure than silence. So much have we deemed it fit to say of conventions generally, because our resort to this measure has been treated by many as if they were something radically wrong with the very idea of a convention. It has been treated as if we were some ghastly secret conclave, sitting in the darkness to devise strife and mischief. The fact is, the only serious feature in the argument against us is the one which respects color. We are asked not only why hold a convention, but with emphasis, why hold a colored convention? 
Why keep up this odious distinction between citizens of a common country and thus give countenance to the color line? It is argued that if colored men hold conventions based on color, white men may hold white conventions based upon color and thus keep open the chasm between one and the other class of citizens and keep alive a prejudice which we profess to deplore. We state the argument against us fairly and forcibly and will answer it candidly and we hope conclusively. But that answer, by that answer, it will be seen that the force of objection is after all more in sound than in substance. No reasonable man will ever object to white men holding conventions in their own interests. When they are once in our condition and we in theirs, when they are the oppressees and we are the oppressors. In point of fact, however, white men are already in convention against us in various ways and at many important points. The practical construction of American life is a convention against us. Human law may know no distinction between men in respect of rights, but human practice may. Examples are plainly abundant, painfully abundant. The border men hate the Indians, the Californian, the Chinaman, the Mohammedan, the Christian, and vice versa. In spite of a common nature and the equality framed into law, this hate works injustice, of which each of the, each in their own name and under their own color may justly complain. The apology for observing the color line in the composition of our state and national conventions is in its necessity and in the fact that we must do this or nothing. For if we move, our color is recognized and must be. It has its foundation in the exceptional relation we sustain to the white people of this country. A simple statement of our position vindicates at once our convention and our cause. It is our lot to live among people whose laws, traditions, and prejudices have been against us for centuries. And from these, they are not yet free. To assume that they are free from these evils simply because they have changed their laws is to assume what is utterly unreasonable and contrary to facts. Large bodies move slowly. Individuals may be converted on the instant and change their whole course of life. Nations, never. Time and events are required for the conversion of nations. Not even the character of a great political organization can be changed by a new platform. It will be the same old snake, though in a new skin. Though we have war, reconstruction, and abolition as a nation, we still linger in the shadow and blight of an extinct institution. Though the colored man is no longer subject to be bought and sold, he is still surrounded by an adverse sentiment which fetters all his movements. In his downward course, he meets with no resistance. But his course upward is resented and resisted at every step of his progress. If he comes in ignorance, rags, and wretchedness, he conforms to the popular belief of his character. And in that character, he is welcomed. But if he shall, if he shall come as a gentleman, a scholar, and a statesman, 
he is hailed as a contradiction to the national faith concerning his race, and his coming is resented as impudence. In the one case, he may provoke contempt and derision, but in the other, he is an affront to pride and provokes malice. Let him do what he will. There is at present therefore no escape for him. The color line meets him everywhere and in a measure shuts him out from all respectable and profitable trades and callings. In spite of all your religious, your religion and laws, he is a rejected man. He is rejected by trade unions of every trade and refused work while he lives and burial when he dies. And yet he is asked to forget his color, to forget that which everyone else remembers. If he offers himself to a builder as a mechanic, to a client as a lawyer, to a patient as a physician, to a college professor, to a college as a professor, or to a firm as a clerk, to a government department as an agent or an officer, he is sternly met on the color line. And his claim to consideration in, in some way is disputed on the ground of color. Not even our churches whose members profess to follow the despised Nazarene, whose, whose home when on earth was among the lowly and despised, have yet conquered this feeling of color, colored madness. What is true of our churches is also true of our courts of law. Neither is free from this all prevailing atmosphere of color hate. The one prescribes the deity as impartial, no respecter of persons, and the other, the goddess of justice as blindfolded, with sword by her side and scales in her hand, held evenly between high and low, rich and poor, white and black. But both are images of American imagination rather than American practices. Taking advantages of the general disposition in this country to impute crime to color, white men color their faces to, to commit crime and wash off the hated color to escape punishment. In many places where the commission of crime is alleged against one of our color, the ordinary processes of law are set aside as too slow for the impetuous justice of the infuriated populace. They take the law into their own bloody hands and proceed to whip, stab, shoot, hang or burn the alleged culprit without the intervention of courts, counsel, judges, juries or witnesses. In such cases, it is not the business of the accusers to prove guilt, but it is for the accused to prove his innocence, a thing hard for any man to do, even in a court of law, and utterly impossible for him to do in these infernal lynch courts. A man accused, surprised, frightened and captured by a motley crowd, dragged with a rope about his neck in the midnight darkness to the nearest tree and told in the coarsest terms of profanity to prepare for death, would be more than human if he did not, in his terror-stricken appearance, more confirm suspicion of guilt than the contrary. Worse still, in the presence of such hell-black outrages, the pulpit is usually dumb and the press in the neighborhood is silent or openly takes the side of the mob. There are occasional cases in which white men are lynched, but one sparrow does not make a summer. Everyone knows 
That what is called Lynch law is particularly the law for colored people and for nobody else. If there were no other grievance than this horrible and barbarous lynch law custom, we should be justified assembling as we have now done to expose and denounce it. But this is not all. Even now, after 20 years of so-called emancipation, we are subject to lawless raids of midnight riders who with blackened faces invade our homes and perpetrate the foulest of crimes upon us and our families. This condition of things is too flagrant and too notorious to require specifications or proof. Thus, in all the relations of life and death, we are met by the color line. We cannot ignore it if we would and ought not if we could. It hunts us at midnight. It denies us accommodation in hotels and justice in, our, in the courts. Excludes our children from schools refuses our sons the chance to learn trades and compels us to pursue only such labor as will bring the least reward. While we, we recognize the color line as a hurtful force, a mountain barrier to our progress, wounding our bleeding feet with its flinty rocks at every step, we do not despair. We are a hopeful people. This convention is a proof of our faith in you, in reason, in truth and justice. Our belief that prejudice with all its malign accompaniments may yet be removed by peaceful means that assisted by time and events and the growing enlightenment of both races the color line will ultimately become harmless. When this shall come, it will then only be used as it should be to distinguish one variety of human family from another. It will cease to have any civil, political, or moral significance, and colored conventions will then be dispensed with as anachronisms, wholly out of place, but not until then. Do not marvel that we are not discouraged. The faith within us has a rational basis and is confirmed by facts. When we consider how deep-seated this feeling against us is, the long centuries it has been forming, the forces of avarice which have been marshaled to sustain it, how the language and literature of the country have been pervaded with it, how the church, the press, the playhouse and other influences of the country have been arrayed in its support. The progress toward its extinction must be considered vast and wonderful. If liberty with us is yet but a name, our citizenship is but a sham, and our suffrage thus far only a cruel mockery. We may yet congratulate ourselves upon the fact that the laws and institutions of the country are sound, just, and liberal. There is hope for a people when their laws are righteous, whether for the moment they conform to their requirements or not. But until this nation shall make its practice accord with its constitution and its righteous laws, it will not do to reproach the colored people keeping up the color line. For that, people would prove themselves scarcely worthy of even theoretical freedom, to say nothing of practical freedom. If they settle down in silent, servile, cowardly submission to their wrongs for fear of making their color visible, 
They are bound in their own name and on their own behalf to keep their grievances before the people and make every organized protest against the wrongs inflicted upon them within their power. They should scorn the counsels of cowards and hang their banner on the outer wall. Those who would be free themselves must strike the blow. We do not believe, as we are often told, that the Negro is the ugly child of the national family, that the more he is kept out of sight, the better it will be for him. You know that liberty given is never so precious as liberty sought for and fought for. The man outraged is the man to make the outcry, depend upon it. Men will not care much for people who do not care for themselves. Our meeting here was opposed by some of our members because it was disturbed the peace of the Republican Party. The suggestion came from coward lips and misapprehended the character of that party. If the Republican Party cannot stand a demand for justice and fair play, it ought to go down. We were men before the party was born and our manhood is more sacred than any party can be. Parties were made for men, not men for parties. If the six millions of colored people of this country, armed with the Constitution of the United States, with a million votes of their own to lean upon, and millions of white men at their back, whose hearts are responsive to the claims of humanity, have not sufficient spirit to and wisdom to organize and combine to defend themselves from outrage, discrimination, and oppression, it will be idle for them to expect that the Republican Party or any other political party will organize and combine for them or care what becomes of them. Men may combine to prevent cruelty to animals, for they are dumb and cannot speak for themselves. But we are men and must speak for ourselves, or we shall not be spoken for at all. We have conventions in America for Ireland, but we should not have, but we should have none if Ireland did not speak for herself. It is because she makes a noise and keeps her cause before the people that other people go to her for help. It was the sword of Washington that gave independence the sword of Lafayette. In conclusion, upon this color objection, we have to say that we meet here in open daylight, there is nothing sinister about us. The eyes of the nation are upon us. 10,000 newspapers will tell, if they choose, of whatever is said and done here. They may, they may commend our wisdom or condemn our folly precisely as we shall be wise or foolish. We put ourselves before them as honest men and ask their judgment upon our work. Education. On the subject of equal education and educational facilities mentioned in the call for this convention, we expect little resistance from any quarter. It is everywhere an accepted truth that in a country governed by the people like ours, education of the youth of all classes is vital to its welfare, prosperity, and to its existence. In the light of this unquestioned proposition, 
the patriot cannot but view with a shudder the widespread and truly alarming illiteracy as revealed in the census of 1880. The question, the question as to how this evil is to be remedied is an important one. Certain it is that it will not do to trust to the philanthropy of wealthy individuals or the benevol or benevolent societies to remove it. The states in which this illiteracy prevails either cannot or will not provide adequate systems of education for their own youth. But however this may be, the fact remains that the whole country is directly interested in the education of every child that lives within its borders. The ignorance of any part of the American people so deeply concerns all the rest that there can be no doubt of the right to pass laws compelling the attendance of every child at school. Believing that such is now required and ought to be enacted, we hereby put ourselves on record in favor of stringent laws to that end. In the presence of this appalling picture presented by the last census, we hold it to be the imperative duty of Congress to take hold of this important subject and without waiting for the states to adopt liberal school systems within their respective jurisdictions to enter vigorously upon the work of universal education. The national government with its immense resources can carry the benefits of a sound common school education to the door of every poor man from Maine to Texas. And to withhold this boon is to neglect the greatest assurance of its own perpetuity. As a part of the American people, we unite most emphatically with others who have already spoken on this subject in urging Congress to lay the foundation for a great national system of aid to education at its next session. In this connection, as, and as germane to the subject of education under national auspices, we would most respectfully and earnestly request Congress to authorize an appointment of a commission of three or more persons of suitable character and qualifications to ascertain the legal claimants as far as they can to a large fund now in the United States Treasury appropriated for the payment of bounties of colored soldiers and sailors and to provide by law that at the expiration of three or five years, the balance remaining in that treasury be distributed to colored colleges of the country, giving preference as to the amounts to, this, to the schools that are doing effective work in industrial branches. Civil rights. The right of every American citizen to select his own society and invite whom he will to his own parlor and table should be sacredly respected. A man's house is his castle and he has a right to admit or to refuse or to refuse admission to as he may, as he may please and to defend his house from all intruders, even with force, if need be. This right belongs to the humblest, not less than the highest. And the exercise of it by any of our citizens toward anybody or class who may presume to intrude should cause no complaint. For each and all may exercise the same right toward whom he will. When he quits his home and goes upon the public street and is a public house, he has no exclusive right of occupancy. He is only part of the great public. And while he has the right to walk, ride, 
and be accommodated with food and shelter in a public conveyance or hotel. He has no exclusive right to say that another citizen, tall or short, black or white, shall not have the same civil treatment as himself. The argument against equal rights at hotels is very improperly put upon the ground that the exercise of such rights, it is insisted, is social equality. But this ground is unreasonable. It is hard to say what social equality is, but it is certain that going into the same streetcar, hotel, or steamboat cabin does not make any man society for another any more than flying in the same air makes all birds of one feather. Two men may be seated at the same table at a hotel. One may be a Webster in intellect, the other a Guiteau in feebleness of mind and morals. And of course, socially and intellectually, they are as wide apart as are the poles of the moral universe, but their civil rights are the same. The distinction between the two sorts of equality is broad and plain to the understanding of the most limited, and yet blinded by just, blinded by prejudice, men never cease to confound one another and allow themselves to infringe the civil rights of their fellow citizens, as if those rights were in some way in violation of their social rights. That this denial of rights to us is because of our color, only as color as a badge of condition, is manifest in the fact that no matter how decently dressed or well-behaved a colored man may be, he is denied civil treatment in the ways thus pointed out, unless he comes as a servant. His color, not his character, determines the place he shall hold and the kind of treatment he shall receive. That this is due to a prejudice and has no rational principle under it is seen in the fact that the presence of colored persons in hotels and rail cars is only offensive when they are, when they are there as guests and passengers. As servants, they are welcome, but as equal citizens, they are not. It is also seen in the further fact that nowhere else on the globe, except in the United States, are colored people subject to insult and outrage on account of color. The colored traveler in Europe does not meet with it. And we denounce it here as a disgrace to American civilization and American religion, as a violation of the spirit and letter of the Constitution of the United States. From those courts, we have solemnly sworn to support the Constitution and yet treat this provision as if with contempt. We appeal to the people and call upon our friends to remember our civil rights at the ballot box. On the point of the two equalities, we are determined to be understood. We leave social equality where it should be left with each individual man and woman. No law can regulate or control it. It is a matter with which governments have nothing whatsoever to do. Each may choose his own friends and associates without interference or dictation of any. Political equality, flagrant, as have been the outrages committed upon colored citizens in respect to their civil rights. More flagrant, shocking, and scandalous still have been the outrages committed upon our political rights by means of bulldozing, who cluxing, Mississippi plans, fraudulent 
count tissue balance and the like devices. Three states in which colored, colored people outnumber the white population are without colored representation and their political voice suppressed. The colored citizens in those states are virtually disfranchised. The constitution held in utter contempt and its provisions nullified. This has been done in the face of the Republican party and successive Republican administrations. It was once said by the great O'Connell that the history of Ireland might be traced like a wounded man through a crowd by the blood. And the same may be said of the history of the colored voters of the South. They have marched to the ballot box in the face of gleaming weapons, wounds, and death. They have been abandoned by the government and left to the laws of nature. So far as they are concerned, there is no government or constitution of the United States. They are under the control of a foul, haggard, and damning conspiracy against reason, law, and constitution. How can you be indifferent? How can, how any leading colored man can allow themselves to be silent in the presence of this state of things, we cannot see. Should tongues be mute while deeds are wrought which well might shame extremist hell? And yet we are mute and condemn our assembling to speak out in manly tones against the continuance of this infernal reign of terror. This is no question of party. This is a question of law and government. It is a question whether men shall be protected by law or left to the mercy of cyclones, of anarchy and bloodshed. It is whether the government or the mob shall rule this land. Whether the promises solemnly made to us in the constitution be manfully kept or meanly and flagrantly broken. Upon this vital point, we ask the whole people of the United States to take notice that whatever a political power we have shall be exerted for no man of any party who will not in advance of the election promise to use every power given to him by the government, state or national, to make the black man's path to the ballot box a straight smooth and safe as any other American citizen. Political ambition. We are as a people often reproached with ambition for political offices and honors. We are not ashamed of this alleged ambition. Our destitution of such ambition would be our real shame. If the six millions and a half of people whom we represent could develop no aspirants to political office and honor under this government, their mental indifference, barrenness and stolidity might well enough be taken as proof of their unfitness for American citizenship. It is no crime to seek or hold office. If it were, It would take a larger space than that of Noah's Ark to hold the white criminals. One of the charges against this convention is that it seeks for colored people a larger share than they now possess in offices and emoluments of government. We are now significantly reminded by even one of our own members that we are only 20 years out of slavery and we ought therefore to be modest in our aspirations. Such leaders should remember that men will not be religious when the devil turns preacher. The inveterate and persistent office seeker and office holder should be modest when he preaches that virtue to others, which he does not himself practice. Woolsey, could only tell Cromwell to fling, to fling away ambition properly when he had flung away his own. 
we are far from affirming that there may not be too much zeal among colored men in pursuit of political preferment. But the fault is not wholly theirs. They have young men among them, noble and true, who are educated and intelligent, fit to engage in the enterprise of pith and moment, who find themselves shut out from nearly all avenues of wealth and respectability, and hence they turn their attention to politics. They do so because they find they can find nothing else. The best cure for the evil is to throw open the avenues of activities to them. We shall never cease to be despised and a, and a persecuted class while we are known to be excluded by our color from all important positions under government. While we do not make office the one important thing, nor the one condition of our alliance with any party, and hold that welfare, prosperity, and happiness of the whole country is the true criterion of political action for ourselves and for all men, we cannot disguise ourselves, we cannot disguise from ourselves the fact that our persistent exclusion from office as a class is a great wrong fraught with injury and ought to be resented and opposed by all reasonable and effective means in our power. We hold it to be self-evident that no class or color should be the exclusive rulers of this country. If there is such a ruling class, there must be, of course, a subject class. And when this condition is once established, this government of the people, by the people, and for the people will have perished from the earth. That's the end of our dramatic presentation for this evening. Thank you very much for your attention. Now, the sad part about Zoom, although we are united in a global audience all across the world has been tuning in, all Keith has is Dominic and me to thank him with our smiling faces for his immensely uh, moving and stirring recitation and performance of Frederick Douglass's speech in 1883. Um, Keith, uh, if we had a live audience with us all in one place, I know there would be a standing ovation. There's no small thing to make it look as easy as you just did. Uh, to take those run-on sentences and those many, many compound statements and to thread the needle so beautifully. Thank you so much for making sense of the speech, for all the hard work you put into it, and for your presence and for your charisma. It's so great to have you with us tonight. Um, again, uh, I can hear the uproarious applause, but again, all you have is Dominic and me thanking you and signing off tonight. We're going to put you in the audience with immense gratitude. I uh, hope you'll stick around, and I know we'll be doing this again soon, seeing you again soon for the next event. Thank you, Keith, for your contributions and for everything tonight. Um, while we put Keith in the audience, um, we're going to bring up our panelists from the audience. Uh, and as we're bringing up our panelists, um, we're going to plant the first seed of the first question. We're going to ask you as an audience, as soon as the panelists are done with their brief opening remarks, um, a little context uh, this speech doesn't really require context, but it was delivered on September 24th, 1883 at the National Color Convention uh, in Louisville, Kentucky. Um, Douglas had been attending colored conventions for almost all of his life. Um, he's 65. He's been attending them for over 40 years. But this year's particular, this year's um, specific color convention was highly contested. Um, this is of course, 20, nearly 20 years after the end of the Civil War and about six or seven years after the repeal of Reconstruction and the end of Reconstruction. And Douglas, apparently uh, the night before, was part of a large debate about who would be the president of this colored convention. And at midnight the night before, he was elected president. And this is the opening uh, speech he delivered to this colored convention in 1883. Um, and, and given that context, in spite of the fact that this uh, um, speech is over 140 or almost 140 years old, 
uh, it resonates in all kinds of ways and we don't want to legislate them. But Dominic is going to kick off our conversation by just mentioning the, our first question to you and then we'll come back to you as an audience in just a few minutes after our panelists have spoken and we'll ask the question again. But Dominic, over to you for the first question. Thank you so much, Brian. So yeah, so the first question for the night is going to be, what spoke to you? What resonated with you in this speech? What was true? And um, we just want you to think about that. Uh, your response doesn't have to be polished. It doesn't have to be, it, it just has to be what you feel and what you're thinking about with regard to what was just presented to you today and what your personal experiences have been. Thanks so much, Dominic. I uh, really appreciate that. Um, all right, Ava, I told everyone that uh, whoever's making the best eye contact gets to go first. And I'm getting, even though there's no possibility of eye contact on Zoom, Ava was making contact. So Ava, um, I'm gonna ask you to go first if you don't mind. And if you could just introduce yourself and say a little about who you are as it pertains to what you have to say and launch directly into your comments. We'd be grateful. Again, these are our seven panelists uh, called from five different campuses at Penn State. Uh, representing a variety of communities uh, and perspectives. And we're really excited to hear from you all. Ava, you'll be the first tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you, Brian. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Ava Starks. I am currently a third year student on the Penn State University Park campus, majoring in culturally diverse event management with minors in African-American studies and Spanish. I currently serve as president of the Penn State Student Black Caucus, and I'm I'm very excited to provide my undergraduate perspective of Douglas's words, especially during Black History Month. And I would like to thank the Center for the Performing Arts at Penn State and Theater of, Theater of War for um, organizing this virtual event. Um, in response to Dominic's question, one line stood out to me. It was um, to forget that which everyone else remembers. And these words stood out because Black people are often asked to leave race out of it. However, why should we leave out an aspect that is so essential to who we are? And it's so essential to the things that we experience on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. Understanding Blackness in all of its forms and in all of its settings is the first step in bridging the gaps that fundamentally like separate us as people. And um, when we better understand each other, our identities and our histories, um, even the parts that are difficult to discuss, like race. We are doing the work in breaking down systemic injustices through engaging in discussions like this. We are choosing to grapple with the color line that Douglas spoke of, and um, that's just something that really resonated with me throughout the reading. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ava, for saying that. Um, that 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 touched me in a way that makes me think about what was happening with Tyree um, when he was killed. And, you know, is it possibly more than race? Are there other things that are happening where we're, we're affected in a way where, you know, we wanna even hurt people that look like us. It's not just a thing where, you know, we have to be afraid of white people now. You know, it's very concerning to me that in some ways, you know, this this bleeds into another aspect, like what's happening in the head of, of Black people where they would beat someone to death on camera. Um, but I, I love the fact that you talked about how there's, there's this component of race that's threaded into what I believe happened last week that makes me concerned about how we see each other. So thank you so much for adding that. Mm. Thank you, Dominic. I really appreciate it. And thank you, Ava, for being the first. Uh, Julio, you're right next to Ava in my block. So we're going to go to you next, and then we'll go to Janelle after Julio. So stay tuned, Janelle. Julio, over to you. All right. Is my audio OK? Yes, it's great. Thank All you. Right. Well, first off, thank you guys for having me. Uh, my name is Julio Toussaint. I'm from Penn State Edmonton, third year student, uh, majoring in history with a double minor in African American and Latino studies. Um, also, former president of the um, <clears throat> Black Student Union on campus. Excuse a me campus is traditionally the land on which a college is. Sorry, that's my Alexa machine. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, anyways, the part that stuck out to me the most was uh, this line here where he goes about um, the historical significance relevant to today. He says, um, having watered your soil with our tears, enriched it with our blood, performed its roughest labor in times of peace, and defended it 
defending it against enemies in time of war, which is talking about all the different things that Black people have done for the U.S. over the years through thick and thin, which is amazing to me knowing that this speech was, you know, given 140 years ago, and we can still find things historically relevant um, today. So thank, thank you. Thank you so much, Julio. I really appreciate you being second and and making that connection and for pulling out that line. Um, we're going to let that line float because I'm sure other people will want to respond to it as the conversation continues. And if Alexa wants to respond, Alexa is also welcome to be part of the conversation too. This is the world we live in. Uh, we're in dialogue with technology and with each other at the same time. It's totally fine. Uh, so um, thank you so much. Thank you for what you shared. Um, Janelle, over to you as our third. Thank you so much for your patience. Oh, no, thank you. Um, and also Brian and Dominic for putting this together. Uh, it's, it's an amazing experience already. Just sort of listening, I got chills. Um, and there are actually two lines that that stood out for me. Um, by the way, my name is Janelle Moore Almond. I am a teacher in the Philadelphia School District. I teach history. Um, I also work with the Colored Conventions Project out of Penn State. Um, we've brought some of their curriculum into our classroom. And I'm also a mother, um, a mother of, of Black children. And the first line that stood out to me was the color line meets him everywhere. So it doesn't matter who I raise my children to be. It doesn't matter who I am. Um, the choices I make, uh, the decisions that I choose, the fact that I am a Black woman in America defines so much of my experience and also my children's experiences. And when I think about my children, it's not just the children that I birthed, but the children that I teach every day, um, children that are consistently met with the limitations of racism in this country, which sort of connected to the next line that stood out to me, which is how can you be indifferent mm. when we know that we are working for a world that raises not only like citizens, but good humans. How are we indifferent to the things that have been going on for over 150 years? Like we talk about how the speech um, was delivered 140 years ago, but slavery ended 158 years ago and so many things in the speech still resonate. So many of these things are still true today. Is it indifference? that we are still in this place, having these conversations. Thank you so much, Janelle. It's so powerful to have an educator, um, especially one working in the schools in Philadelphia speak at this point in the conversation. I was so moved listening to you speak and also thinking about the political platform around education that Douglas was putting forward. And it was a really powerful platform out of which the public school system was really born in, in our country, the inalienable right of all children, no matter you know, where they come from or who their parents are to have a quality education. And yet, as we know from the state of our federal system and our state systems, um, there is so much work still to be done to achieve that reality. And that um, what Jonathan Kozel has talked about, you know, in his, in his books about the state of American education. And I think about the, um, I went to as, as a young person and growing up a, a federally desegregated school where it was 99% black and 1% white. And it was a formative experience for me to see and experience the conditions in that school. But I think that's a, that's a reality that so few people have had and uh, made contact with. Um, so this platform, this position he puts forward uh, feels as relevant as it was then as it is now. And I get the sense that Douglas is calling attention to a structure of oppression that was being put into place in the 1800s, late 1800s, that has only grown and accrued uh, power over time. Um, and maybe not in a linear fashion, but over the aggregate of those 140 years. So anyway, I, I'm just so moved and so grateful to have you in the conversation and you with us and thank you for the work that you do. Um, Alessandra, you're, you're next. I'm so glad not Neil made it back. Uh, we're going to bring him in in just a second, but Alessandra, uh, over to you. Hello. Thank you for inviting me to this discussion. It was really powerful. I um, 
First, let me introduce myself, sorry. Uh, my name is Alessandra Ayub. Uh, I'm a first year here at Penn State Wilkes-Barre. Uh, I'm intending an undergraduate degree in criminology. And the thing that resonated with me the most from this speech was uh, the part where Keith said, well, Frederick Douglass said, <laughs> <laughs> not the business of the accused to prove guilt, but on the accuser to prove innocent, in innocence in regards to um, violence against black people. And to me, this really stuck with me because in my degree, I really, I intend to focus on the victim more than how our system focuses on the offender. And to me, this quote was really powerful because our system is meant to look at the offender and then have the offender prove their guilt. However, with instances of violence against black people, that script is flipped for some reason. And it's, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find my words. It's really, it's unfair that as a society that we so-called call ourselves to be so just and have these just laws and have this criminal justice system that is um, so like self-righteous, I should say, that when it is black people that are the victims, especially of our own system, we take their innocence away from them. We don't even give them the chance to, to say their story. And to me, that was the part of the speech that really stuck out the most. Yeah, I, I wanna thank you for saying that. You know, I speak from a personal experience about um, you know, what it is to be impacted by the criminal justice system. And I often like to remove that word justice and replace it with just us. And, and my personal experience has been that most of us are not fighting for a first chance. We're really fighting for a second or a third. And some of the things that happen in those places are, um, it, you know, it makes me wonder how complicit are we that we would take children and throw them in cages for decades at a time, um, primarily because they're black and brown and they come from communities that don't have money. And one of the things I'm really trying to figure out and unpack is why is poverty not a crime? Why is it okay in the land of the free in the home of the brave to treat human beings less than animals, to move them around in places with more handcuffs and restraints and shackles than you would put on an animal. And in 140 plus years times probably 1000, we continue to stand by and what's even worse is we call that system just is beyond me. But I, I really want to thank you for communicating that, unpacking that. Um, that struck me in a way um, that most people probably wouldn't understand because of my experiences. So thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks, Dominic. Yeah, I, I was struck by Douglas's description of blind and impartial justice as a manifestation of American fantasy, he says in the speech. Um, but I appreciate both of you unpacking what that fantasy means in terms of human suffering, in terms of black and brown suffering, what it's meant over the last 158 years and for the obviously years that preceded that over the last 400 years. Um, Thank you so much. Um, Terry, you've been waiting for some time. And Nat Neil, we're so delighted you made it back. We lost you for a second. We're going to come to you in just a moment. But Terry, uh, over to you. Yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you for having this discussion. Um, I'm still trying to process that speech. OK, <laughs> so it takes me a minute or two to process. And I, I, and I really appreciate Dominic on this call, too, because 
typically we, we do not hear the perspective of folks who've been system impacted. So I'm so happy that you're on this call. Um, I actually wrote down pretty much everything everyone just said. Um, so I'm going to choose the one that hasn't been said yet. Um, so again, I'm Terry Watson. I'm a staff person. I work in disability services at Penn State World Campus. Um, I'm also an author. And I also work with law enforcement, uh, trying to uh, work with well, Black officers, majorly, to change the system with inside. And so the thing that stuck out to me was this American imagination versus the American practice. Um, I came, you know, I, I really struggled with the Tyree Nichols situation. And 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 from the point from the perspective of doing so much work with law enforcement, there's a time when you have to reflect and you have to begin to ask yourself you know, where, what are we doing? Like, what is it that we're trying to do, right? I put out a piece right after that, um, you know, and a lot of it was frustration, of course, but a lot of it still rang true. And th the one thing I wrote down here is, you know, how long do I have to adjust my character to meet the American, what they call the American imagination? when this practices is making me walk this color line as, as, as the speech was saying. And I think a lot of the frustration that was echoed in 140 years ago, we are still seeing it today. Mm -hmm. So for me, that was the part that stood out the most was that American imagination versus the American practice. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes we have to realize what, uh, what space we're currently working in. Um, and for me, you know, there's the part where he, he mentioned that, you know, you know, we are Americans, right? We shouldn't have to fight for what is supposed to be a right, life, liberty, and a pursuit of happiness. But we find ourselves doing just that. Um, so that's what stood up to me. I, and I, I would have many more to say, but I want to give someone else a chance to talk. Thank you so much, Terry, for all your words and for the work you do. Um, it, it was a lot, it, you know, th this is actually about 60% of the speech. Obviously, uh, Douglas is a ma master orator, incredible thinker, as also comes out of a time of textual culture where people would sit for speeches that long and we, we're not used to it. So it's something really kind of the exercise of sitting for an hour and listening to someone string together sentences that long is really powerful too. And we have at least another hour to process it. So as things come to you, we'll hopefully we'll hear from you again. But I appreciate you being present with your thoughts about Tyree Nichols and your work with law enforcement and connecting it to the tension between American imagination and American practice. That's really powerful. Thank you for drawing those distinctions. And if I could, Brian. Yeah. What else is left to be done, Terry? Like how much more work is 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 necessary to be done? And um and and I appreciate that. I appreciate someone who understands what it is to work from the inside out. And despite, you know, the you know, I'm gonna call it murder, you know, not a situation. I am going to identify what I saw as brutal murder, stuff that soldiers would be prosecuted for if they conducted themselves like that, not only here, but anywhere on the planet. So, um, but, but thank you for that. And thank you for continuing the work and understanding that um, we have so much farther to go. Brian? Avery, thank you so much for your patience, Avery. Uh... Our, our sixth panelist from Penn State, over to you. Hi, my name is Avery Chal. I am uh, so honored to be here among so many brilliant people. I'm very honored by your presence. I am a doctoral student at 
Penn State University Park in human development and family studies. I study peer relationships and children and adolescents, and I'm going to fight the academic urge to jargon you all to death today. <laughs> I wanted to kind of actually, Tara, you really touched on something that I was hoping to bring up as well. So um, I had a slightly different quote, but um, in the speech, he said, we hold ourselves to be Americans. If liberty is but a name, our citizenship is but a scam. And I am from an immigrant family. Um, my family immigrated from India and landed a lot of places in the West before we were able to immigrate to America. Um, and that is due mainly in part to the civil rights movement and how the immigration laws were changed um, in the late 60s that allowed me to be here today speaking to you all. Um, I've lived in America since I was, since I can remember, since I was two. And I think I've just had so many experiences living here in central Pennsylvania um, where you realize that no, no matter how long you live here or how long you're a citizen, some people will never see you as American. And I know that that is, yeah, that's a common experience that, you know, like the South Asian immigrant community has in conjunction with the black community that no matter how American you are, how long you've been American, how American you sound, you're never really American. And I think being someone who's lived here for such a long time, as opposed to some of the members of my community who are more recent immigrants, I think my generation has in, in the, the most positive way possible, a sense of entitlement around being American and not letting yourself get stepped all over. And you spend, your community invests so much, you know, like, I think we all know what that community is like, like as people of color, like my community and my family have spent so much time and so much energy lifting me up, helping me get educated, allowing me to become the woman that I wanna be and become a scientist. And then they're just, there comes a point where you finally reach that level and you're in a PhD program and you're doing research and all of a sudden as a woman of color and from an immigrant family, you just burst through the glass ceiling. And I just had this moment where I was like, none of this, none of this is for me. None of this is built for me. And I think that in a more clear way than any other experience in my life has made me realize that all of these systems and in institutional ways that I'm sure many of you have faced in much more brutal ways than I have, um, yeah, pervades, it pervades. So yeah, the tendrils of white supremacy wrap around my community and your community. And, you know, I hope to, yeah, I hope to, our communities to continue to support each other in, in brotherhood and sisterhood. And yeah, that's, those are my thoughts on that. I got really like, ooh, that whole speech like hit me so heavy. So I'm glad you came to me last so I could kind of like bring it down. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you, Avery. Um, I, 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 had a, I had a feeling that you might like some time and I'm glad that you took it uh, uh, because your contribution to this conversation has moved it in a new direction. The more complicated the conversation gets tonight, the better and the more nuanced and sometimes irresolvable it becomes, I think the better, because there's no space in our culture, even in academic life for that level of complexity and that level of messiness. And um, I appreciate you talking about your community and the connection to the struggles of the community that Douglas was referencing in his speech and how deeply interconnected they are uh, and how deeply interfused white supremacy is with all institutions in America. And he's naming it and you're naming it. And so I appreciate that very much. Thank you so much. Um, Nat Neal, you've been waiting for some time last, but by no means least, uh, before we move on to our larger audience, our global audience and our Penn State audience, um, over to you. You there, Nadia? Uh, Good. Uh, yeah. Can, can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Nat Nella Bate, but uh, I often go by Nate. Um, I am a senior at Penn State uh, University Park, majoring in biobehavioral health with a minor in human development and family studies. Um, 
I, I thought the speech was really powerful as well. And um, just to go off of what Avery had said a um, couple minutes earlier, um, there was a moment in my life where I was like, okay, um, maybe the system isn't built for me. Like I, I can't walk in the same path as everybody else. And there's always gonna be certain barriers within uh, the goals I wanna reach. So then um, when Frederick Douglass um, mentioned in his speech, he brought up Ireland and um, talked about how they held conventions, um, which I'm, um, and he mentioned, is how Ireland was successful in gaining support because they were always in the media and kept noise. Um, I couldn't, it was a long quote and I, I couldn't type it all fast, but um, I, I felt like he it was more like a call to action to um, the people at the convention, African-Americans to be more vocal and proactive in their efforts to like uh, secure like equal rights. And then, um, he asked a question a couple statements later saying, why are we at this convention? And this I was able to catch, uh, to answer this, we answer first because there is a power in numbers and in union. So I understand for, yes, there are barriers and um, the system isn't built for me and other people like me, um, but it's, the more we talk about it and have conversations and events such as this one here, I feel like the more impact we will be able to have. And um, yeah, there's there's power in number and we can't let conversations like this die down. Um, it's important to keep bringing these things back up. Thank you so much, Nate. I really appreciate that. Um, I'm so glad that you were uh, able to catch all of it and that you got were able to join us again. Um, it's so wonderful to have at least from my perspective, so many young people with us today. It's so refreshing and so powerful and um, such a shot in the arm. I, I, I sometimes, when we're performing, we perform quite a bit uh, for all kinds of audiences, lose sight of uh, it, how powerful it is to be in the, in the presence of young people wrestling in, in the present moment, what Frederick just, Douglas just put forward through Keith David. Um, and I want to thank you all for being present with your thoughts, for your candor, for your courage, for not knowing necessarily what you were going to say, but still saying something as it came to you, for modeling a way forward for our audience that's going to now join us on screen. And as we mentioned to you before, as we were briefing you, um, if something comes to you that, you, you know, as other people are speaking and you want to jump back into the conversation, all you have to do is use the raise your hand function or even unmute yourself and jump right back into the conversation. We'd love to hear from you again, but thank you for lighting the fire and for getting it started. Um, we're going to now uh, move to our audience members before we do, and I see our first online so, uh, so far as Karen Brandon, but before we go to Karen, um, I just want to restate the question that Dominic said a, a few minutes ago. This is out to the audience uh, of people all over the country and the world who are watching. You know, in spite of the fact that this speech was delivered in 1883, um, close to 20 years after the end of the Civil War, six or seven years after the end of Reconstruction, and Douglas was seeing structures put in place that we've only seen come to their fruition 140 years later to the scale that he couldn't have imagined even in its own time, in spite of everything that separates us from uh, the, that colored convention and that time, what spoke to you tonight? What resonated with you? What touched you? What was true? Um, and uh, Karen, you were the first to come onto the screen and you were also the last to leave the screen at a recent event called Antigone and Savannah. And so we're delighted to have you back because we weren't able to get to you in Antigone and Savannah. Um, and I know you had a lot to say, so um, we're eager to go to you first. What spoke to you tonight, Karen? What resonated with you? What was Thank you, you, Brian. Well, a lot spoke to me tonight. Uh, I feel uh, thoroughly, completely spoken to. Uh, but what I'm gonna what I'm gonna choose from the uh, all the all the things I wrote down was this: dragged in midnight darkness to the nearest tree. And the reason I choose that is because this is what I've been, what my life has been around, work, working around and working with for the last 30 years. Um, two weeks and 110 years ago, 
four innocent Amer African Americans were murdered on a tree in Hamilton, Georgia by my white ancestors and their neighbors. One was a woman, one was a preacher, two were farmers. One of the farmers was kin to the sheriff who was my great grandfather. Lodeska Crutchfield was killed when Frederick Douglass gave this speech. 39 years years ago, I set out to uncover this and other racial crimes committed by my ancestors. I wrote a book called The Family Tree. Last night in Hamilton, Georgia, a community program went down to plan the building of a sacred memorial. Park in partnership with the Equal Justice Initiative. The team is made up of white descendants of the lynch mob and black descendants of the victims of this and other lynchings, as well as folks who just care. It is led by the black mayor whose ancestors were enslaved by mine. We have been told by some that what we're doing is divisive. We have been told by some educators and school officials uh, that they will not support our essay, essay contest if we use the phrase racial justice. In this audience tonight are others who have also uncovered their ancestors' racial crimes and are working to confront their own racism while addressing the ways these historic harms are baked into our nation's laws, policies, and practices. We do this work in partnership with many organizations, including Coming to the Table, Equal Justice Initiative, community remembrance projects around the country, and the Civil Rights and Restorative Justice Project. I want to thank Brian Dorries and his incredible team here at Theater of War for these amazing programs. My work has been deeply informed and enriched by your work. Frederick Douglass speaks as truly in our time as he did in his time. Both Antigone and Creon are still alive and struggling in Hamilton, Georgia today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. So just to give a larger context, if you've come to one of our events, you've, you, you're part of a larger tapestry of other events that are all deeply interconnected. It's one big Venn diagram overlapping. And so, and um, our last big event was in Savannah, Georgia, uh, where we were taking on the question of what does healing look like? Uh, the, we were in the oldest African uh, American uh, church in America, uh, First African Baptist Church. Uh, but we were supposed to be, because of rain, we were supposed to be that night in a, an unnamed square that used to be named after John Calhoun, the name recently stripped a month prior, on land that sat on an unmarked burial ground for enslaved Africans in Savannah, Georgia. And that was the context in which we first overlapped with Karen. And she raised her hand, wasn't able to come on. But I'm so glad you did tonight, Karen, because this question of what does healing look like in some ways is answered by your by your testimony of what you have been doing and the work you've been doing. I appreciate you, you. Uh, to to us and moving the conversation right. uh, toward the section in Frederick Douglass's speech where he talks about the infernal Lynch courts. Um, thank you so much for naming it and for for joining us tonight. Um, I think next in order is Star Lit. Uh, I, I, that's what we see on your screen, Starlet. So we're going to go to you next. Uh, over yeah. to you. <laughs> that, that is, <laughs> I am a writer, and my <laughs> my name is Starlet Swan. So, okay, breathing in. The thing that really got to me the most was the fact that he had to explain throughout the whole of the this, this speech why they had a right to have a black convention or color, like he said. To me, it feels like when he was saying by us having this convention, then we're being prejudiced because we're not letting white people in. It reminds me of Black Lives Matter. When we're stating Black Lives Matter, 
is not trying to say nobody else's life matter. It's just putting the focus on the problem that the others are not being killed, but ours are being. And I feel that in order to give an example that the thing of why there should be a black convention, it would be the same way as saying, if there were people that had been raped and they had a convention, would it be conceivable or logical that they would invite the rapist? It's the same situation. And I did write a poem about how a black person might feel in order to bring understanding to everyone. Death comes with a badge to my door, to my car, to wherever I am. Death comes in blue, no matter what I do, no matter what I didn't do, no matter the facts. Death comes unjustly, no right to defend myself, no right to speak, no right to write. Death comes like a blue swarm, stinging me, beating me, killing me. Death comes to take my life before my time. Get on the ground. What did I do? I don't know. Pepper spray. What can I do? I don't know. Punch. Help me. Kicked in the head. Mom. My heart can't take this anymore. Mom. Death comes for me with a shining badge over a brutally blue field. The title of this poem is In Memoriam, Tyree Nichols. Thank you so much, Starlet. I really appreciate you being with us and sharing that. And, you know, we ask our panelists to quote a line from the speech that moves them, but I love that you chose to also respond through your own poetry and to bring it into the room as part of the text tonight. I'm like, did you want to respond? I didn't, I didn't want to cut you off. No, no worries. Thank you, Brian. Uh, thank you so much, Starlet, as well. You know, we have over 25 different projects. And in one of them, we say, you know, we talk about what it is to re-traumatize people and to be victimized. And we talk about where's the power in re-killing the dead and uh, all of these years later, you know, I just feel like, you know, poem after poem, you know, um, you know, memorial after memorial, you know, Eleanor Bunkers, you know, Rodney King, Sean Bell. We do a lot of work with Sean Bell's mother and the mothers of the movement, um, Gwen Carr. And um, the night that I viewed this tape, I made it my business to reach out to both of them just to check their temperature and make sure that they were okay because I knew that it would, you know, I knew that it was, it, their names would come up and it would be another example of why it's so important to um, express our thoughts in the way that you did tonight when you um, read that beautiful poem. Thank you so much. Um, we have a long way to go and a lot of work to do. And if there's someone on this planet that doesn't see that, then then we have even more work to do. Um, thank you, Brian. Thanks, Dominic. Yeah, I, I love also, Starlet, that you brought in this rhetorical question of, you know, that obviously Douglas is having to justify having the convention at all as its president to, to a country that's saying, to a country that's saying, why would you have it? And even to people within his ranks saying, if we have it, are we not reinforcing the color line by drawing the line ourselves? And it feels like a form of gaslighting that's happening to them, just like the brutality of what we're talking about in terms of the police and racialized violence that we've been talking about that. And, and 
Fred Douglas speaks to that, the terror that evokes and the terror that was in your poem too. And he says, a man accused, surprised, frightened and captured by a motley crowd dragged with a rope about his neck in midnight darkness to the nearest tree as Karen mentioned and told in the coarsest terms of profanity to prepare for death would be more human if he did not in his terror stricken appearance, more confirmed suspicion of guilt than the contrary. I, I watched as much of the video as I could and the terror that I saw and the humanity that I saw, the combination of the two. Um, I, I knew how it touched me, but I also know how reframed by the media and by those who rhetorically wish to gaslight people with their own terror, with their own trauma, um, how it could be perceived, how it could be misconstrued, how it could be, the, the narrative could be stolen. I, so I, please. I forced myself to watch the videos. I didn't want to but I felt that I needed to be witness, that we'll need to be witness of injustice, so horrible. And then when I saw it, I, I felt many emotions and I needed to let it out in a way that was constructive. And that's when I wrote the poem. And I am extremely grateful for having had the opportunity to share it with you all. And I would like to share it and offer it to your organization, to what you, Dominic, and you, Brian, are doing. If you guys can use it to bring change, to make people understand the fear that we feel, I, I, I would be honored. Thank you so much, Starlet. We will definitely be in touch. Uh, and, and we're grateful to you for reading it here tonight. I also want to say there's so much we could respond to, but the analogy you made to rape and to rape culture, also, I don't want to just elide and skip that over because that was a really apt and powerful analogy you brought into the room. But there are many other people who are waiting to speak, so we want to get to as many as we can in the limited time we have. Um, I believe we're uh, going to Divine next, which I love that name very much. Divine, over to you. Uh, you're next in line. Uh, thank you, uh, Brian. Thank you, everyone, for allowing me to share space with you all tonight. Um, I could not pick one line. Um, so my name is Devine Lipscomb. I'm a first year master's student here at Penn State University Park studying uh, clinical rehabilitation and mental health. Um, I'm also the f uh, a formerly incarcerated a uh, scholar here at the university and the first black elected official to state college borough and the first formerly incarcerated elected official here as well. Um, and I, I, I preface that simply because we had a killing here of a young black male, uh, Osadi, I'm going to say his name. And in spaces like this, it's important that we remember those that we lose. Um, to police violence and systemic violence. Um, and I am an elected official only because our community suffered that loss, right? Because it, it was in the same themes that uh, our ancestor Frederick Douglass spoke on um, that, that, that systemic violence and that targeting of black men uh, and women and how we also do not hold seats of power, right? Uh, particularly in the realm of governance. And a lot of that governance is taken away from us at young ages. I was incarcerated at 14, 15, and then I did a long stretch um, at 16 from New York State's stop and frisk. The only reason why I was stopped and frisk so much it's not because I was committing crimes, but because there was an influx of police on the streets of New York uh, in, the, in the 90s and still now, where uh, the more um, you encounter police, the, the higher your chances are of actually going through the system, right? Uh, the police are not uh, circling around our town here at State College. 
stop in and frisking people because if they did, uh, the community would raise hell, right? Um, that's one. And two, we would have more people who are uh, privileged and white uh, flooding our, our, our county correctional facility. Uh, and so as I was listening to the speech, I was supposed to be writing a paper, uh, but Dominic, when I heard Dominic's introduction, I paused and then I, I actually heard um, what was happening in the speech and I'm like, wow, we still are targeted um, 140 years later. Uh, that speech could have been written yesterday. Uh, we still are, are not allowed to govern and, 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 and a sense that uh, we are represented. I should not have been the first Black American to be elected in my town. Um, and the way and the rates that we incarcerate people, I should not be, of, I only know of three formerly incarcerated folks who hold state office, Tara Simmons in Washington and another gentleman in Washington, DC uh, and myself. There's millions of people who have been in the carceral system. Um, and so there's another voice that we are missing. Is that done on purpose? And if so, are we blinded to this? And at what point do we say white supremacy is not just in policing, it's not just in government, but it's also internalized and in where we feel that we are not enough and we need to be perfect in order to occupy these spaces of change. Right. And so then how do we we work to dismantle all systems, not just external, but internal systems as well. And then what does that look like? And how do we how do we even start? Right. Um, but thank you for allowing me to share space with you all. And mute it. Thank you so much, Divine. Um, Dominic, I'd love for you to respond, but also um, before we go to Dr. Fraser, I, I, I would love for you to ask your second question. Um, Dominic and I are always sort of trying to feel the room. When should we drop a second or third question? You can, Dr. Fraser, especially, you can ignore the question. You can assimilate it into your perfect statement, uh, you know, making sense of it all. It's all really variations on the same theme, but we wanna try to perturb the conversation, maybe move it in a couple other directions. Divine, I really liked your questions too. And we'll let that float because other people I know will answer. But maybe Dominic, you could respond and answer and, and ask your question because I, I think it's a good time now. And then we'll go to Dr. Uh, Roan Fraser next. Yeah, so first of all, th thank you, Devon. Um, I really feel like what, what you discuss is the new form of lynching. You know, it's just, you know, we're still dragging people to that dark tree and that dark space. It's just happening in a new way. And uh, Douglas spoke about that, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna highlight um, a quote that he made that's in reference to that. And he said the same, the same old old snake, though in a new skin, and that is exactly what is happening today. So um, Douglas talked about the color lines and how they bleed into every aspect of American life. And that touches on everything that's important to people who live on this planet, things like law and economics and policy and housing, education, civil rights, employment. And though much has changed over the last 140 years, the color line is still very much with us. It is still present today. And it is part of the American fabric of the society that we live in, unfortunately. And Douglas uses the phrase to describe the nation, its laws, its policies, and the political parties. And he calls it what I just said a little while ago, the same old snake though in a new skin. How does that phrase sit with you tonight? What does it say to you? Is our second question. So Dr. Fraser, you're next. Again, over to you. Um, you can riff on that or you can move in whatever direction you'd like. I expect you'll do all of the above, but the floor sure, is yours. Thank you. Sure, thank you. I think the, um, the monitor should be muted. Thank you. 
Um, thank you to the Color Conventions Project and the Center for Black Digital Research for hosting this, this amazing talk. I'm glad to see from my department, Jim Casey and his wife, um, at this. Thank you to Keith David also for his. We're we'll still getting some feedback from you. Dr. Stop, 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 stop. What happens if you have this? Turn your volume up and we can speak through the. How do I turn my volume? Oh, muted. Yeah, <laughs> now, now we can't hear you at all, unfortunately. Watch Gabriel. Oh, still him queuing. I think he's going to leave the room. This is how we solve problems in the 21st century. Uh, in our, I mentioned there would be glitches, there would be challenges, but that's okay. Thank you for your patience. Um, no problem. You. We're in this together with you. Um, the Center for Black Digital Research, thank you for this opportunity. I took three notes. I was I, I teach this book. I'm a visiting professor in African-American studies here at Penn State, and I teach Douglas's third biography, uh, The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass, which came out about this time. Um, in that third one is really a fuller view of all the people who gave their life, who interacted with him, and it's a sober account that he provides. So what he's saying here, I'm, I'm remembering the references from that third autobiography, um, particularly John Brown, you know, who gave his life um, um, in 1859. So he's looming in Keith David's performance. And I remember Keith David's amazing performance um, years ago in Nativity with Felicia Rashad and Stephanie Mills and Elias White and his booming baritone. And like you said, Jeffrey, uh, Keith David, he just makes it every single thing one thread, you know, so that um, the beat of Douglas's message comes through. Um, three points that I took down. Um, Douglas said, prejudice may be removed by peaceful means. I think that was an important message at the colored convention when the temptation is to, as he um, talked to John Brown and told John Brown he could not overthrow the government by violent means the way John Brown was asking him to. Um, and he was, he, was, he was very sober about that. The second point that stuck out to me um, is so true. And if you don't work for freedom, like Harriet Tubman, like Frederick Douglass personally discovered, it's not going to be valuable when somebody gives it to you. So when Douglas says liberty given is not so precious as liberty sought or fought for, and sometimes when you fight for it, you lose. So I was thinking about John Brown um, in that particular part. And, 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 and his critique for the Republican Party, I think is so important because the Civil War birthed that whole party, you know, which was the Whigs, um, Liberty Party and the Free Soil Party. But um, when, when Keith David said, if the Republican Party cannot stand for justice, it should go down. And that's the beauty of America, the ability for the citizens. Um, and it's in the Constitution. Um, liberty is something you have to fight for. And if you discover, the people discover, the parties that are already there, um, such as the Free Soil Party, are not representing the people's interests, um, it should go down. And so that's that's what really stuck out to me. Are the Democratic Party, is the Democratic Party or Republican Party in 2023 um, meeting the needs of working people? Um, there's another part of this speech which, which Keith David did not read about the wage slavery and the sharecropping system that was absolutely powerful. For me, it's the most powerful part, and I'm sure um, Mr. David would do justice to that. The final point that stuck to me was he was talking about the state. Um, he said the state currently cannot provide education for its own youth. And that, of course, made me think of DeSantis trying to deconstruct AP African American Studies in Florida and how, regardless of what the state does, Douglas knew this personally, you have to learn for yourself. You have to teach yourself. You have to, for your children, 
uh, make sure if the state is not providing it, you, the parent, is providing it. Uh, because as it currently stands, it's not going to provide education for its own youth. Thank you again, Senator, Center for Digital Black Research and the Color Convention Program for this event. Thank you so much. This was the perfect opportunity for someone as deeply versed in this speech as you to come into the room and explicate it in all these ways. And I really appreciate all the points that you brought uh, to the fore and also how it resonated with what Dominic asked about the same snake, though in a uh, same old snake, though in a new skin. He's explicitly referring to the public Republican Party in that moment. But to your point, that could be any of our parties uh, at the present moment. I, you know, having just heard our president's State of the Union last night, and now reflecting upon what he said, and also the behavior in that room, and the erosion of decency that we saw. You know, are, what are we looking at? Are these are these parties representative of the interests of working people, of black and brown people? Are they, or, or are they, um, the same? Are they perpetuating uh, these uh, injustices that we've been talking about? Uh, in ways that need to be named and called out and the consequences are that they should go down. I really appreciate you drawing that line. Um, thank you so much for your uh, working through the technical issues. We're delighted that you were able to speak. And Dr. Uh, Kathy Bullock, you're next in line. Thank you for your patience. Uh, over to you. Thank you so much. My name is uh, Dr. Kathy Bullock. I am a professor recently retired. Maria College in Kentucky, although I'm from DC. I've been here over 30 years. And I'm using music, particularly African American music, as a bridge. We use the arts as a bridge, as a connector, uplifter, inform, informing. First of all, let me thank you, um, uh, Brian, and all of you for uh, putting this on and the grace, Brian, that you show as you respond and navigate us through this whole thing. I really appreciate that. A second thing, I just wanna take a moment to express the fact that when I see this thing that Frederick Douglass said 140 years and that things are so similar now, I am filled with anger, with sorrow, with rage. I'm ready to light fire or something. You know, the fact that 140 years, we still, okay, I just had to get that out. I, I, Y'all, I just had to get that. Because, um, but because, but I can't stay there. You know, I can't stay there because I would just, <clears throat> I would just explode. Um, I got, I have a, a, a black son. I got a black husband. I got a black brother. You know what I'm saying? And, and, um, and I speak to hundreds of young people. I mean, I do these programs all over the world. And I smile a lot, but I'm telling you, that got, ooh, it took a minute. It took a minute. I'm just being real. Okay, I had to say that. The second thing is that one of the things stood out for me. It says, he said, we do not despair. We are a hopeful people. And my question is, are we still? Um, because that hope is a choice, you know, um, and I know that. And I know I have to channel all of this, this anger, this rage, and why we still at the same place now, no matter how much, you know, I have to channel that in a way that's going to be productive and fuel me moving forward. And um, I have to think in terms of Frederick Douglass 20 years after, after enslavement. And here we are 100 40 years after his speech and saying, oh, this sound like the same thing. Um, it's, it, there's a lot of things that have changed. I know that, you know, a lot of things have moved forward and I need to keep moving forward with that. But that is my question now. Um, not so much a question, but just a challenge for me, maybe others, um, where's that hope now? He said the faith within us is confirmed by facts. In some ways it is but we can't forget what he spoke and, and what he dealt with as we move forward. Let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Bullock. I really appreciate that. Um, uh, you've lit up the board with some of the young people in the room. And Nate, I saw your hand go up. I hope it, uh, it didn't go down. Did, did you want to respond to Dr. Dick? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I just wanted to point out, um, she she asks, we still have hope, and um, I think uh, that sparked this um, or something that Frederick Douglass mentioned in his speech, where 
Um, a little bit before, after the snake statement, um, he acknowledges the fact that um, it, it takes, it, like nations to develop is slow and it's, it's gonna take time for changes to occur. And it's, if, and we need to keep that in mind when we're progressing through these years and developing uh, a, a better society that can uh, better fit all of us. Um, and we're at a point where everyone is equal um, but it, yeah, he, he mentions that it's unrealistic to just simply assume that, you know, changing laws, eliminating like prejudice and discrimination, that's not the only thing that's going to fix the issues that we have. Um, and it's important that we keep that fire lit within us. And I mentioned a, uh, earlier that there's power within numbers. So as long as we continue to like push out the, the main agenda, um, it may take another 150 years, 140 years, but it's something that we should always um, strive to achieve. Thank you, Nate. I really appreciate it. Alessandra, you had your hand up as well. I don't want to, we'd love to hear from some young people. And then Terry, I know you've been waiting for some time too, not to be ageist. We'll go to Alessandra and then we'll go to you. Uh, Alessandra. Thank you. I just really wanted to thank Dr. Kathy for your authentic response. And I wanted to bring up a quote from Frederick's speech where he said, um, this, is, this is brought out because I wasn't able to write out fast enough, so I'm sorry if this is incomplete, but he said, mental and moral ability for their happy solution. And I think often white people or people that really haven't experienced the raw like anger, frustration, that people of color have felt often want a happy solution. They want people of color to approach them with like peacefulness and like, I guess baby talk them, if that makes sense. But I wanna say that like often anger is a first response and that it's not wrong to, to feel anger. And I really appreciate that like, that you brought that to this because a lot of times people see anger and belittle it or see anger and just kind of not take it serious. Thank you so much, Alexandra. Uh, I really appreciate you acknowledging it. There has to be a space for rage and there has to be a space for outrage and there has to be a sp space for grief. As Dominic mentioned, we've done a lot of work with mothers of the movement. I, I remember some performances we had almost 50 mothers of the movement led by Gwen Carr in our audience. And it broke, broke everybody's heart, but there was a space that could hold all that grief when we all stayed in the room as hard as it was to hear. And um, so I appreciate you leading with your rage uh, uh, tonight and others acknowledging that that, you know, I also appreciate the fire that Keith brought to certain sections as he read too. It's not as, even though Douglas is so rhetorically controlled, uh, such an amazing orator, you feel the emotions coming through in certain sections too. Um, Terry. Ryan, Dr. I, I just wanna, I wanna thank you, Dr. Um, Bullock, because uh, you asked a, what I believe is a really important question. And that is, is do we remain hopeful? And I'm gonna say very candidly from a person who's been through a lot of trauma and a lot of pain, um, I think the answer to that is unequivocally, absolutely yes. And the reason why is because if we're not hopeful, we are hopeless. And that is an extremely dark place to be in. Darker than the trees and in the spaces that they would hang us in. So, Thank you. Um, we have to be hopeful. And if not, we are hopeless. Thank you, Barry. Thank you, Dominic. Terry? Uh, yeah, I appreciate Dr. Kathy and also the other brother that was right before as well. Um, the one thing that I wanted to contribute, because it's already been said by the folks before us, but in regards to hope, I, I I do agree with Dominic that we we have to be hopeful. There was a piece in here in in, in Douglas's speech um, that sort of resonated with me in, in this quote too. Is if we move, our color will be recognized, and it's necessary. 
And one of the things that got me thinking is about all the things that's necessary to progress. And I think hope is one of them. You know, I, um, again, I, I remember, I, I again, I, I wrote a book called um, Welcome to the Sick Mind of the Same Person, Deconstructing Racism and White Supremacy. And I was very critical of hope throughout the book. But the reason why I was critical is because, and again, going back to what Douglas was saying, I was thinking people were hoping for the American uh, imagination, but not doing any work behind it, not actually being willing to actually make that imagination come true to turn the imagination into practice. So I do appreciate the anger behind it because that's part of being human. I think we have the right to feel. We have the right to uh, uh, express ourselves. I think keeping that inside uh, is always a danger um, because that does, again, I use the words contribute to a sick mind because you would then begin to go to that dollar place. Mm -hmm. um, so I do appreciate all the uh, uh, people who are sharing and definitely being so vulnerable too, because that's another part of this conversation. We are all being vulnerable in this open space. And I, I, I just wanna say, I appreciate everyone. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Starlit. I saw you, I think Terry lit up Starlit. So I'm we're gonna go over to Starlit and then we'll go down to Dimitri who's been waiting patiently for some time. Thank you. And then um, we'll, we'll progress. Thank you, Starlit. I wanted to, to address you, Dr. Cassie, with one of my poems, if that's okay. Please. The title is Anything is Possible. Hope is the last to go, but when hope is gone, God is found, strength is found. We fall for the last time, summoning the last vestiges of our faith. We stand up, never to fall again. For the seed of true faith is harvested when there is none left. Faith grows in hopeless soil when the will to fight seems gone and we don't know why or why we should try. And yet when all is gone, we stand on the true faith that we have sown. When all is gone, when there is nothing left, the realization comes that anything is possible, even the impossible. Thank you, Starlet. I know that if we were in a uh, live venue, you'd hear us all applauding, but you just have. Thank you, Starlet. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Uh, someday, maybe when Theater of War Productions has evolved to the next level in our work, people will only respond in poetry. But until then, uh, you're showing us the way. So thank you so much. Uh, Dimitri, um, you've been waiting for some time and I see people using the various functions here to applaud too. Thank you for your patience, Dimitri, uh, over to you. Uh, thank you, Brian. Um, I'm definitely honored to be on, have the opportunity to speak with you all. Um, I just wanna thank uh, Brian and Dominic uh, because I usually don't do stuff like this, uh, come on camera. Um, but you guys definitely created an atmosphere where I felt welcome uh, to share my thoughts. I um, also want to thank the students for their vulnerability. Um, it's always nice to see people passionate about change, and especially in our community, because sometimes our community needs it the most. Um, so just a little bit about my background. Um, I received my PhD from Penn State in 2014 in the field of chemistry. Um, I transitioned into the industry and been working as a software engineer for the last seven years at financial institutions. And the thing that really stuck out to me in this speech, oh, and the last thing I wanna say is I got, I got wind of this session tonight from Facebook I kept getting Facebook ads about Keith Davis hosting this session. And I love Keith David. One of my favorite movies is They Live. And I'm pretty sure he was in that in another John Carpenter film. I did not expect it to be like this. So thank everybody for that. Um, so what stood out to me in this speech with, from Frederick Douglass is um, his, his idea about this color line and how we're constantly kind of reminded 
of the fact that we have color in our skin. And it's always and typically reminded in a way that's uh, negatively, um, negatively um, kind of reciprocated. And that's sometimes that's not only from what we call white people, but also other black people. Uh, we look at each other with skepticism and we've been conditioned um, to kind of have a sense of fear of our own people. And it's very uh, strange to me that this still exists. And it must be systemic uh, because you can find it in young children who already know their value by the time they hit five years old, Clark Dahl experiments, that type of stuff. Um, and I really resonated with Nate and Avery um, when they talked about this like epiphany that this country is not really for me um, or that I don't really belong here. And so I just wanted to share that that constant reminder from the color line at the age of like 37, which is what I am now, I've really hit, and I live in State College as well. I moved here recently. Um, that constant reminder has gotten me to a point where I have this kind of slogan I say to myself, I say, this ain't it. What I mean by that is, <laughs> I don't, this country is not for me. And so all the color line that I see when I go to the bank to get a loan or I go to the doctor to get a checkup or I go to Weiss Markets over there by State College High and I don't feel entirely comfortable, this ain't it. I'm really not supposed to be here. I was brought here and I was placed into this society and now I'm forced to deal with it. And it's extremely frustrating. And sometimes I look at videos from other places in the earth like the continent of Africa and specifically South Africa and I say maybe I'd be better off there I'd love the idea of walking into a business and seeing people who welcome me who want me there who don't think about me in a negative way not that everybody does um, but that sees me as a human being and I have that relaxation right that relaxation that I'm just a human trying to live a human existence and be free. So I just wanted to share that, um, that I resonate with that idea. And I've, I've, I'm thinking about what that means for me, that I don't belong here, what I can do with that. Um, so I, I've never really done anything like this, Brian and Dominic. Uh, it's such a honor to just be able to share some ideas that I've been thinking about. So thanks to everybody. Thank you so much, Dimitri, for your perspective and for your Thank you. candor. Uh, we know we've done our work when someone joins us and says, I don't do this. And it wasn't Dominic and I who did the work. We did a little of it, but it was really everyone who's on screen right now yeah. who made it possible by democratizing this conversation and saying, Dimitri could feel comfortable in this, in this crowd, with these folks. You could share that with us. So thank you for sharing it with us, Dimitri, and thank you to everyone else for making it possible. It's it's um this to me is what it's all about. Um and uh and what you said is a is a real is real provocation. I I I don't I want to let it float. We're coming to the end of our time, but we didn't come here to resolve the conversation or tie a bow on it or say neatly, okay, we've checked this box and we can all go about our lives. Um, you know what you named is your truth and it's it's a hard truth and it's complex and it complexifies the conversation even more than others who have shared and i really appreciate it dimitri um i see terry's hand and i see christina has been waiting for some time uh oh and i saw julio raise his hand too but we're coming up to one minute left in our allotted time <laughs> so so terry i have deference for the fact christina has been waiting for some time uh i'm gonna we're gonna go to christina um christina Absolutely no pressure to sum everything up into one perfect statement. Oh, I lost you, Christina. Oh, there you are. Okay. <laughs> but, Hello. But... Sorry, I just had to chime in and um, a little bit about myself. I'm an alumni from Temple University. I studied um, a master's of public health in social and behavioral sciences. Um, and just when uh, Dominic spoke about the um, 
what was it called the snake with the with the different clothes on um it came it just resonated with me so much because i was just thinking about all of the different industries in our society um whether it's healthcare education and how um black and brown children are given a short end of a stick or they're in some ways like seen as a villain in a sort like I remember I, I'm a product of the Philadelphia school district and when I went to high school I would have to go through metal detectors and and everything just to go to school like almost if I was a criminal and it was just to get my education and thankfully that didn't stop me but that could be something that hinders someone to go to school and just seek education when someone is treating you as if you were a criminal just for trying to go to school and um, that's just one way I feel like that our systems are not built for us um, and another um, another thing that came to mind I'm sorry I'm kind of nervous um, another thing that came to mind was in um, just in healthcare in general because that's the field I'm in and, and it's there's so much health disparities that can be broken down by by race that it, it shows how these systems are not in place for us. Women, black women especially, are dying from childbear, child um, birth more than any other woman in the country, and that's those are disparities that can't be ignored. And those are like, in my um, opinion, like those are the snakes with different clothes in all of our different industries that affect us all in our daily life. And thank you for letting me be here. This was a very great conversation. Thanks so much, Christina. Um, I thank you for taking on Dominic's question, first of all, <laughs> and for tying things back to the Philadelphia school system uh, and to Janelle, as who started us off in the beginning, and for naming something that I think hasn't gone unnamed, but saying it in such a specific way, in such a powerful and important way. I mean, the reason we, we've, this is the second time we've done the speech. The first time was in Staten Island, which if you've been to New York City, you might know is kind of almost like crossing into the deep south, <laughs> but but um, you're just crossing um, the base of Manhattan. Uh, sometimes it feels like into another country. And uh, it's it, in that first performance and now today listening to you all, it takes us about a hundred sessions to know what we're doing with a project. So thank you for being part of the grand experiment and teaching us about this text tonight everyone has taught us something um you know i get the sense that douglas is speaking with prof you know, prophetic voice about the present moment because he kind of sees past the interpersonal to the systemic in 1883 and he's able to articulate and talk about how these systems were structured and built in the wake of the dismantling of the advances of reconstruction for for black people and for the formerly enslaved and we're only now seeing them the way he saw them then through the lens that he saw in 1883 and I, I just appreciate you speaking to that from a health perspective from a psych psychology perspective from a systems perspective we also know that in our conversations when we move sometimes past the interpersonal to the systemic we're, we're actually getting somewhere in the conversations too. And it's nice to come to some, not resolution, but come to that place in the end of this discussion. Julio had his hand up and Julio, we are out of time, but we're gonna go to you. No pressure to bring us home with like a perfect summarizing statement that's gonna just <laughs> connect all the dots, but you're gonna have the last word in this conversation tonight. Um, I appreciate that. Um, I just wanted to give one quote, um, from Malcolm X about uh, progress. And he said, um, what happens when you pull a knife out six inches from someone, someone's back? And uh, what happens when you pull it all the way out? There's no progress there. The progress is healing the wound. So I just wanted to say thank you for um, everyone who organized this um, program because conversations like these is what you know progresses us and heals the wounds from our past. Thank you so much, Julia. That's a, actually a perfect last word. <laughs> um, and uh, it never ceases to amaze me how people do it when we say you're going to have the last word and then they say the perfect <laughs> last word. Um, but Julio, thank you for that last word of Michael Mex, acknowledging that out of this violence and out of this trauma comes the possibility for healing. And in that healing comes the community that we're building here tonight and the connections we're building here tonight. Um, 
Thank you all. I want to thank, first of all, Keith David for his amazing performance. He's still watching, and I know he had his hand up earlier, um, but he declined to come on the screen. We want to thank him for uh, the nuance, the beauty of what he brought to us, his service. I want to thank our panelists for their incredible uh, insights and candor tonight and for getting us started with their beautiful and present responses to Keith's delivery of Frederick Douglass's speech. I want to thank all the people who joined us on screen uh, from all from the Penn State community, but also um, from other parts of the country and the world um, to share their truths and perspectives. I want to thank Dominic for grounding our conversation in a different hierarchy, one not born out of privilege and power, but out of proximity, um, which is where I feel like we should center these conversations, but sometimes the systems within which we're working and the institutions don't allow it. Um, and I'm grateful uh, to others who joined us who had experiences with incarceration, with, with uh, education, with political disenfranchisement, who brought those experiences to the table. That was the currency of this discussion tonight. And it's the currency of every discussion we have at Theater of War Productions. And we're grateful to Penn State for partnering with us to create the conditions for tonight's conversation. And uh, uh, for all of the partners that were mentioned, um, we, we encourage you to attend Douglas Day. We dropped the link into the um, chat earlier. Um, you know, Douglas's 205th birthday is coming up, the celebration on uh, February 14th. You could celebrate Valentine's Day if you'd like, but I think the, the, the more operative thing would be to celebrate Douglas and uh, maybe with your sweetheart. Um, and, um, you know, we, uh, we want to encourage you to come to our next performance. Um, before that, I want to thank Marjolaine Goldsmith, who's been running this whole thing from behind the scenes, who, without whom we wouldn't be doing any of this, our company manager and digital producer, uh, Sita Frederick uh, at the Center for Performing Arts at Penn State for the invitation. Um, and uh, we just want to encourage you to come to our next performance because, as I mentioned before, we didn't come here to finish the conversation as... Uh, Karen demonstrated by speaking earlier, these are all one conversation. And our next conversation will be happening on uh, February 23rd. And that's with our project, The Nurse Antigone, which is a pre presentation of Sophocles Antigone with Margaret Atwood, Jesse Buckley, um, Frankie Faison, Otto Blankson Wood, and a chorus of frontline nurses interrogating some of the themes we've talking about tonight about social determinants of health, the color line as it meets healthcare, but also the unique challenges faced by nurses over the last three years, the past, present, and future of nursing. And then on February, and that's the nurse Antigone, we're dropping that link into the chat now. The next one after that, February 28th, uh, will be the Suppliance Project led by Alfred Le Molina, uh, Frankie Faison, Nyasha Attendi, and a chorus of community members from eight different immigrant backgrounds from San Diego. That'll be a live performance at the University of California, San Diego, that will be presenting on Zoom as well, hybrid, and bringing people into global dialogue with a play by Aeschylus, about 50 refugees seeking asylum at an ancient border from forced marriage and violence. And all of these are overlapping and interconnecting subjects. All of them have a chorus that emerges, and we hope the chorus that emerged tonight will join us and speak to the chorus of the next, and that you consider yourself, if you've never been to one of our events, um, invited. And you've been added to our mailing list too, whether you like it or not, I apologize in advance. Um, so you'll be getting invitations to these upcoming events, but we hope to see you again soon so that we can continue this dialogue um, that we started here tonight. If we had one message to deliver to you 140 years after Douglas's speech, it's simply this. If you're uh, you related to anything that was said in the speech or in this room, this brave space we've created together, you're not alone in this space in this room. You're not alone across the country and the world. This is the end of the second presentation of the Frederick Douglass Project, and I hope there are many, many more and that you'll attend them, because if you've seen one, you've seen one. Most critically, you're not alone across time, not alone across the last 140 years, not alone across the last 400 years. You're not alone across millennia, um, and that can bring both comfort and rage, and there's space for all of that in our discussion and in the ongoing dialogue we'll be having with you, I hope in the weeks and months ahead, years ahead. Um, but you are not alone across time is the public health message of Theater of War Productions. Uh, this is 
a struggle that is global. It is a struggle that is basic to what it means to be human and is a struggle that we're in together. And um, I'm grateful to everyone who came together and was were vulnerable and present in the way that we were all tonight. Before we close out, I just want to say that we're going to drop, we dropped a link into the chat for those of you in the Penn State community. Penn State would like, especially would like to know a little bit more about who you are and where you are in the campuses so they can um, gain traction for doing more events like this. So we'd be grateful if you could take the brief survey at the end when it pops up as you close out. But before it closes out, I just, uh, Dominic and I uh, are wishing you all um, well, all, all our best wishes. Dominic, maybe you can close this out. Yeah, no, thank you, Ryan. Thank you, everybody um, here tonight. Thank you, everyone who participated in this experience. We are wishing you much, much success, much, much healing, and, and an opportunity to just continue to be involved in the work that we're doing. There's so much more to be done. Um, we're humbled and, and honored to be here with you. And and I know that I speak for the entire company here at Theater World Productions, Marjolyn Goldsmith, Brian Dory. Thank you, Penn. Um, have a good evening, everybody. We're looking forward to seeing you at our next performance. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Dominic. And I see Keith joined us on screen. Good night, Keith. Thank you again. We'll see you at the next one. Appreciate you, Keith. Good night, brother. All best. Good night, night everybody. everybody. Thank you so much. It's a great Thank discussion. You. Blessings to you. Discussion. Yes, thank sir. you. Thank you so much. I thank my, you. The, my email. Thank you, Starlet. I got it. I got it. Thank you so much. Thank you for this. It's amazing. Thank you. This was a fantastic discussion. Thank you all. Thank you, Terry. Thanks, Terry. Good night, Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. No. Bye.